Hello and welcome to 10 mind-blowing research findings to supercharge your lessons. My name is Nicholas Walker and this is the web version of a presentation I gave at the 2018 uh, Rascals Colloquium in St. Hyacinth, Quebec. Let me start by asking you a question. Do you read educational or applied linguistics research? I, uh, I highly recommend that uh, you get into the habit. Um, it's very interesting. There's so much to learn these days, and there's so much of it. Um, I, I'm sure I could have come up with a hundred findings, uh, not all as mind-blowing as the ten that you'll hear uh, now, but uh, there are just amazing insights to be learned from the research that's available today. So what you can expect. Um, first, I should tell you that your mind is not safe. I'll have 10 chances to, to blow it, uh, that is to blow your mind, and uh, you can expect that I will keep my word. Uh, I have put in nine two-minute conversations in this web version. I'll, uh, I'll give you some warning and ask the question, and you can pause the video uh, and uh, have a discussion with uh, your colleague, or just think about it yourself uh, before restarting the video and hearing my answer. Um, now, uh, I don't suggest that you uh, argue with the findings. I, I spent the past five months putting this together and I'm quite sure that uh, I've got it right. So um, resistance is futile, so to speak. And you can get the handout and the slides at the end. Uh, I've made them available on the virtualwritingtutor.com and uh, you're welcome to, to have the slides and the handout and uh, share it as you like. Okay, so let's get started. Um, first, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, I've taught at a number of different colleges in Quebec, uh, including the Salle College, André Laurendeau, the Cégep de Saint-Hyacinthe, uh, Montmorency, and Ahunsic College, where I teach now and uh, have, uh, have tenure. Um, I have a number of degrees. I have a BA in English Literature, a TESOL Certificate, and an MA in Applied Linguistics, all from Concordia University. And during that time, I taught in South Korea for a total of five years. More recently, I've won two awards, uh, the TESOL Canada Innovation Award and the Sesquicentennial Pin for Leadership in Education. So here I am in the top right, receiving my uh, pin from uh, the Honorable Melanie Jolie, a Member of Parliament for Hunsic Cartierville and uh, Minister of Heritage. Uh, and in the bottom right, you can see me with my award-winning textbooks and my award from TESOL Canada. Now, if you're wondering what my students think of me, you can uh, look me up on Rate My Teacher. Um, I have 4.9 stars on 5 and uh, a number of uh, very positive comments. Um, but uh, I don't think you should be too impressed by this. Um, it's certainly a problem for me in that uh, working at multiple stageships is the norm and it's actually just proof of how hard it was for me to get a full-time permanent job. Uh, the degrees that I have are quite common in the field and uh, let's face it, Rate My Teacher is gossip and it's prone to a mob effect. That is to say, uh, if somebody starts uh, with negative comments, other people pile on and add uh, additional negative comments, feeling emboldened and encouraged by the ones that are already there. And if they see positive comments, uh, equally they, there's a mob effect and they tend to, to add to it rather than contradict what's already there. Um, I should say that every used car dealer has an award on his desk, uh, whether honest or not. Um, so uh, awards don't always mean very much. Um, and finally, I think the most important point is that uh, the all of these positive experiences, these positive assessments I've received uh, of, of my, my teaching and my learning, um, you know, they actually uh, impede or my ability or my, my motivation to improve my teaching. So in, in the absence of negative assessments of my teaching, 
uh, there's the danger of of complacency of this view that uh, I'm good enough and there's nothing more for me to learn and uh, this is particularly worrying in light of the first finding and here it is the first mind-blowing uh, research finding to supercharge your lessons and it's this more than 90% of teachers think that they're above average. Um, this is an example of something that's come to be known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. And uh, it's evident in the fact that low ability teachers cannot recognize their own ineptitude, mistakenly thinking that they're better than they are. And high ability teachers underestimate how long it takes for people to learn and overestimate how much other people know. And, and you can see this in that uh, low ability teachers just don't know enough about pedagogy to recognize the weakness in the pedagogy that they themselves use. And high ability teachers, people with uh, advanced degrees, PhDs and expertise, um, routinely underestimate the amount of time it takes to develop the skills that they themselves have. And, and this has been seen in the lab uh, where uh, somebody is uh, taught to do something and then asked to estimate how long it took them to, to learn it and they, they, they get it wrong. And then to estimate how long it would take for somebody else to learn it and they underestimate the amount uh, again. Um, and if you've ever met somebody who is, uh, has got a high level of expertise, you'll notice that they uh, freely use jargon and don't recognize uh, opportunities or, 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 or moments when they should actually be defining their terms and avoiding jargon because they tend to overestimate what uh, the other people they're talking to know about the topic. So the, the first big insight from uh, research is that teachers are inept and deluded <laughs> and uh, and this should concern us all, I think. Research, therefore, supercharges education by making our ineptitude visible to us as teachers. And uh, it's a very good reason for all of us to, if not read research, be alert to the findings uh, that come out of research. Okay, so here's a two-minute discussion topic. Uh, for you. How can we reduce teacher ineptitude? Why not talk about it for a couple of minutes and when you're ready restart the video and uh, I'll give my take on the question. All right, if you're ready for my answer, I'll, I'll just preface my answer by saying it's difficult to get teachers to change and that's because in teaching pretty much anything goes. We have professional autonomy. Uh, you'll often hear teachers say, live and let live, or your teaching style suits you, but, but not me. Um, sometimes teachers talk about their, their pedagogy in terms of their philosophy of teaching, or they refer to experiences they have with individual students, uh, at which they generalize to uh, the group or, or to all students. Uh, using anecdotes as a source of information uh, about pedagogy and best practices. So when pressed, uh, sometimes teachers will just avoid um, saying how they got the information, their pedagogical information, and claim that teaching is an art. Well, let's just put that art to the test and ask, uh, in two minutes, which is better, smaller class sizes or computer-assisted learning? Talk about it for a couple of minutes and uh, get back to me to hear my answer. And my answer is this. Teaching is a science. And I know some teachers or some people object to this. A, a skeptic might say, but research can justify any opinion, and perhaps you've uh, you've heard that uh, you know uh, 
there's been research that sh that indicated that vaccines have uh, led to autism. Um, that research actually was retracted and proof proven to be fraudulent. Um, and I understand that research can sometimes give contradictory uh, findings and it can be a little difficult to know uh, what to believe. But I think with some effort uh, and, uh, and some insight, we can get to the right answer. And here's why. And this is uh, research finding number two. Effect size can end debate. And here's how. So effect size is represented as this italicized D, and um, to explain, it is the mean of the treatment minus the mean of the control. And uh, I'll just define what that means. So once you have the, that number, you divide it by the standard deviation. So what does all that mean? Well, Take the score of a small class, for example, uh, the average score of the performance of students in a smaller class, and minus the average score of a large class, and then you divide it by the variability that you can find in the spread of those scores right, uh, that, that gave you the average. And, and this calculation produces something called effect size. And it tells us just how effective a particular uh, treatment or intervention in the classroom is likely to have. Okay, so for uh, smaller class sizes, the effect size is 0 0.21, which I can tell you is a small but significant effect on student performance. But in order to understand how important the, the smaller class sizes is, uh, we need to compare it to other findings. So, so let's have a look. Um, smaller class sizes has an effect of 0 0.21, whereas uh, the effect of computer-assisted learning is 0 0.37. In other words, computer-assisted learning is 75% more effective at improving student performance than reduced class sizes. And here we mean reducing the class size from about 80 down to between 20 and 30. All right, now, the reason given by John Hattie in his 2009 Visible Learning uh, is that teachers in smaller class sizes adjust their pedagogy to the size of the class, including more group learning and giving more feedback on classroom behaviors. With very large classes, uh, it's very hard to track every student, and uh, group work becomes more difficult. Now, if you question the, uh, the reliability of this finding, let me just tell you that this, this number of 0 0.21 is the result of combining the, the effect sizes and averaging those effect sizes from uh, 96 different studies which uh, involved half a million or over half a million students. So the science is robust and the finding is reliable. So there's no point in arguing with it. Uh, we can take this as being uh, very likely to be true. So, um, which is reassuring to me because for the past six years, I've been working on the Virtual Writing Tutor, which is an online grammar checker, because I've been trying to provide my students, and in fact uh, learners around the world, with a grammar checker that provides faster, more explicit feedback, uh, so that students can get feedback on their writing more often, and uh, of course get support for, for lifelong learning, that is to get feedback on their writing even after a, their English courses uh, are, are over, and uh, and to be able to give this kind of feedback with zero impact on a teacher's workload. So uh, if you're interested to learn more about the Virtual Writing Tutor and my approach to computer-assisted uh, language learning, you can have a look at profweb.ca, do a little search for, for me, Nicholas Walker, or for the Virtual Writing Tutor, and you'll see the two recent articles I've written on this topic. Okay, 
So uh, in terms of supercharging our lessons, uh, we can supercharge learning by emphasizing group work with smaller groups and uh, with computer assisted learning. Now, if we put these two interventions together, uh, we're going to get a better effect than just one or the other. All right, so finding number three. Have a little discussion uh, about, about this. What could we do to improve the education system overnight? It's a big question. But talk about it for a couple of minutes, and when you're ready, come back to me and you'll hear my answer. And my answer is this. The easiest way to improve the education system overnight is to fire the worst 10% of teachers and replace them with average teachers. They don't have to be above average. They don't have to be great. Just replace the worst with average teachers and you'll have an effect of 0 0.75. Okay, so to give you an example, if the US were to fire the worst 5% of their teachers, they would have an education system on par with Canada. If they were to fire an additional 3%, the US education system would be as good as the system they have in Finland. And, and what's more, um, if we were to replace the average teachers in the US with uh, above average teachers, each one of those teachers would add $400,000 of value to the economy for every year of service in their careers. All right. Uh, this is a uh, exciting and uh, very compelling research, in my mind. So let's look at finding number four. Um, who do you think we should replace the teachers we fire with? So let's have a two minute discussion. Who is the better replacement for the below average teachers we fire or retire? Is it Bob, who has a BA and five years of teaching experience? Or is it Bill, who has an MA and 25 years of teaching experience? So have your discussion, and when you're ready, come back to me and you'll, you'll hear my answer. All right, so my answer is this. Degrees and experience have no effect on teacher quality. That's what the research seems to suggest. Teachers with 25 years of teaching experience and a master's degree are no better on average than teachers with five years of experience and a bachelor's degree. All the improvement that we see in a teacher's quality happens in the first three years of their careers. And after that, after let's say five years, uh, we see little or no change uh, no improvement in their teacher quality. So let's go to finding number five now and ask, what can you do to improve your own quality as a teacher if experience and additional degrees have no um, direct effect on your, your ability to teach? Have your two minute discussion and come back to me when you're ready to hear the answer. So what can you do to improve your own quality as a teacher? My answer is this. There are three things. Number one is video record yourself and then watch yourself teaching. And then as you watch yourself, focus on improving your clarity. And then focus on improving your relationships with your students. And here we see three effect sizes of uh, 0 0.88, 0 0.75, and 0 0.72. These are all very powerful uh, effects on student performance. So here they are again. The three biggest effects on teacher quality are micro-teaching, that's the name we give to video recording yourself, watching the recording and analyzing your own teaching in a systematic way, that is looking for 
uh, specific uh, elements of our pedagogy each time we watch it. Um, maximizing teacher clarity by communicating the intentions of the lesson and what success looks like. And, uh, and of course, developing good teacher-student relationships through listening, empathy, caring, and having a positive regard for each and every student. So, to supercharge our lessons, video record yourself, scrutinize your instructions and feedback, and work on improving your relationship with every student in the room. All right, let's have a two-minute discussion now. How do ESL teachers routinely sabotage learning? All right, uh, so here we go. Research finding number six, which is actually a collection of uh, a number of different findings. Now, I, I often hear teachers say things like, I chose this textbook because my students really like the colorful pictures, and I get it. A colorful textbook is uh, immediately enticing and attractive to students. And you see them unwrapping their textbooks on the first or the second week and uh, going through the book and looking at all the, the colorful images. And uh, it really looks uh, very engaging. However, the research seems to tell us something else. We sabotage recall with color photos in our materials because thematically related but conceptually irrelevant color pictures in a lesson cause students to learn less. And here's why. And I've taken two almost random pictures uh, of, uh, of pages from a couple of po popular textbooks. The first one on the left, you can see an image of a woman wearing a tutu, wearing sunglasses, and uh, seems to be dancing or, or walking with a man uh, with a headscarf on and glasses. And this image is only tenuously linked to the content of the text on the right-hand side. It's, it's got a thematic link, but, but nothing more. And uh, if you look at the text, it says, is it just government programs that can make life better for people? Um, and then you go down a little bit and it says something about uh, uh, do you know of any people who are actively working in, in neighborhoods? And uh, in the following reading, you'll learn about an initiative uh, that encourages uh, citizens to work together to create events and activities, etc., uh, etc. Et so the, the thematic link is an event or an activity and a picture of people seeming to enjoy an event or an activity. Now, the problem is this. A color picture like this alongside the text attracts readers attention away from the text and so students will remember the picture but forget the message and, and this is understandable because as humans we have an enormous visual cortex and uh, when you uh, you know you give uh, powerful input to the visual cortex it competes with other areas of the brain for attention, and uh, attention is a limited resource. On the other side of uh, the screen, on the right side, you can see a picture of three beautiful young women uh, who seem to be sitting in front of tents. So it seems to have something to do with camping, right? But the lesson is on mixed pronouns and possessive determiners. And, and uh, you can see that the activity is to underline the correct pronoun or possessive determiner. And the first uh, few examples are, uh, we have fun putting up our tent, I love sleeping under the stars, do you like uh, their motorcycle, uh, it's the latest model. So you can see that uh, a couple of the, the items are related to camping and the rest are not. So the way that researchers explain uh, one of the reasons why, why colorful images or irrelevant images or just thematically related images uh, cause students to learn less is that it activates the wrong schema. So instead of the schema of pronouns and possessive determiners, what's being activated is camping. And so this information, the new information they receive, is being filed under the wrong theme, making it inert and irretrievable 
uh, when they need it in the future, and certainly on a test, so their performance is reduced. So, my recommendation is this. Stop ordering textbooks with pretty pictures, or hand out sticky notes to cover up the pictures on the page, because the research tells us that if the students encounter the picture after they've read the text, there's little effect on recall. But if they encounter it at the same time or before they read the text, then uh, they have more difficulty remembering the concepts on the page. Uh, teachers say things like, uh, I really like the emphasis on academic skills. It's something 100s and 101s really need. And by 100s and 101s, I mean beginners and low intermediates. And it's true, we see that students with lower proficiency uh, often have uh, weaker academic skills also. And, uh, and I can see the attraction of, uh, of materials that emphasize academic skills. Nevertheless, we sabotage integrative motivation by uh, exclusively or, or excessively emphasizing English for academic purposes. Emphasizing formal registers alienates non-fluent learners from the target population, and they lose integrative motivation and view themselves and members of the target group as less intelligent, less attractive, less friendly, and, and members of the target group only, as less trustworthy when they find themselves in social situations. If we're training our students for formal situations, it shouldn't surprise us that when students find themselves in informal social situations, uh, they are unprepared to interact. And in fact, because they, they feel so unprepared, it affects their desire, their, their motivation to integrate with the, the population, with the people that they meet. And this should be a real concern to us because we know that it is frequency of contact that leads to better ultimate attainment. That is, uh, the more we interact with the target population, the more likely we are to achieve high levels of proficiency. And so by sending students off into the world with academic English, uh, we have left them underprepared for the kinds of demands of social situations and the interactions that they're much more likely to encounter in the world. So, supercharge your lessons? Well, simply stop teaching academic English to our non-fluent students. And here I'm not referring to our high intermediates or our advanced learners. Of course, that's exactly what they need. They need academic English because they have the conversational English. They have the grammar of the language. What they need is to refine it and to, to gain in sophistication. But for our non-fluent students, we need to focus on the kinds of uh, English that they'll need or the kinds of grammar and target structures that they'll need to interact effectively with the target population. A couple of my students really go to town on the controversial topics and debates. And I've seen this too. Uh, if I bring controversies and uh, debates into the classroom, a couple of students will really get into it and even, you know, dominate the conversation or certainly contribute uh, most of the conversation in, in the lesson. And it really gives me a sense of the success of the lesson. However, we, we sabotage interest-based motivation with debates because controversial topics that support argumentation and debate have been found in the literature to be disadvantageous because of the negative emotions they elicited. Instead of debates, what we should be doing is uh, giving students topics that uh, involve interpersonal scandal. Somebody gets kissed, somebody gets punched, things that arouse curiosity in, in that regard because of their dramatic content, or personal growth stories, chicken soup for the teenage soul, or uh, romance and love. These are all topics that are universally appealing to students, and they're recommended in, uh, in the literature because they produce more conversation and more group cohesion, and therefore uh, better group productivity. 
as we go forward, I want you to keep this image in mind. And that's the image of, uh, of tennis. Now, when you begin to learn tennis, uh, the first thing you need to learn is to get the ball over the net. And instead of competing, what you do is you focus on cooperating and getting the ball back and forth and to rally and to learn some control of the ball and to get it to areas of, of the court on, on the other side of the net. It is fundamentally cooperative uh, in the beginning stages of learning the sport. But once you get competent at returning the ball, then you can start to become more competitive and play a more adversarial game. Well, I think it's the same. The same is true for, for learning a language. At the beginning, we need to emphasize cooperative linguistic exchanges that uh, help people to feel included and a part of the group and a part of the conversation and leave the more competitive and adversarial linguistic tasks for, for once the students have gained a significant amount of control over English. So let's stop pitting students against each other with current affairs and, uh, and controversies. To be persuasive in the real world, business students need to know how to structure well-organized arguments and presentations. And this is, I'm sure, true. But as with anything, we can go too far. We sabotage business communication, it turns out, by overemphasizing argumentation. And we know this because managers in mid-sized corporations in the US uh, were found to use narratives much more than argumentation to resolve conflicts, to motivate employees, uh, to explain issues, or, or particularly to persuade others, or gain compliance to, to new rules or directives, and to generate group cohesion. And, and you can imagine how this might work, right? Uh, a manager might say to their employees, listen, uh, you guys uh, have a conflict. And this reminds me of a time when I worked at Toyota. And back then, there were these two uh, employees who could not get along. And, and this is what happened. And this is how it turned out. So narrative can be so useful to, for persuading people um, to comply or to resolve conflicts or to learn from a prior experience, because narratives work as a kind of uh, flight simulator, a kind of linguistic uh, simulator. It allows us to visit contexts we've never been to before and uh, think them through as thought experiments and come out the other side, sometimes uh, touched and moved uh, by, by the story and, and therefore persuaded much more than a list of facts and a carefully crafted argument is likely to do. We really need to start teaching storytelling. It is uh, fundamental uh, to communication in any language, and it's sorely neglected uh, in, in ESL, uh, by my estimation. Um, I sometimes hear this, that writing the five-paragraph essay is an essential academic skill. And for me, this is uncontroversial. It's absolutely true. The, the five-paragraph essay is a very useful um, pedagogical uh, form that students should learn. Uh, and uh, the, the, that's not really the problem. The problem is this. We, uh, we sabotage critical thinking by overemphasizing the five-paragraph essay. And in fact, when we teach it, we should be aware that uh, choosing a thesis and gathering support for it is, in fact, profoundly anti-scientific. Um, why? Because with science, what you do is you propose a hypothesis, and then you test it, and you do everything you can to disprove it. And if you're unable to disprove that hypothesis, then you accept it as being valid or, or, or potentially valid. And if you continue to uh, find uh, support for it and you're unable to disprove it, then it has a chance to become a full-blown theory. If you think about it, choosing a thesis and then gathering support for it is, in fact, a legal uh, discourse model. And uh, lawyers, of course, are trained to take a thesis. For instance, the defendant is innocent. 
and then to look for a support for that claim. Or the accused is guilty and to look for arguments and evidence to support that claim. As such, the five paragraph essay is a legal discourse model rather than a scientific one. Another problem with the five paragraph essay that we tend to overlook is that by emphasizing this one discourse model in English and in French and philosophy, we think we're, we're uh, helping the student by helping them master the discourse model. But in fact, what we're doing is we're leaving them underprepared for the workplace and university and uh, leaving them, you know, with, without the range of discourse models that they'll need to succeed in these two environments. And furthermore, uh, teaching only the five paragraph essay or, or, or pre predominantly the five paragraph essay has a de-skilling effect on teachers. And think about it. I like to teach blogging to my students because I see blogging as being this enormously popular and powerful way to communicate with literally millions of people around the world. And, and what we see is that there are about half a billion blogs nowadays read by about half a million readers every month. And so blogging is an enormously popular and authentic way to communicate with many, many people. But if you ask teachers, do you teach blogging to your students, they'll say that they, uh, they don't have the technical skills to set up a blog or, or to teach uh, this style or this, uh, this series of discourse models themselves. So by focusing so much on the five paragraph essay, they find themselves uh, without the skills to teach what is now an enormously popular mode of communicating in the real world. And so the five paragraph essay has become a kind of monster. Uh, the introductory paragraph has lots of teeth and no bite. Uh, the thesis statement is the main point of the theme. And you can see uh, the three paragraphs with topic sentences and some minor points, but mostly bulk. And then the concluding paragraph, somewhat limp and drawn out, goes over the same ground as the four preceding paragraphs. This is according to Boynton. Uh, a, an illustrator of uh, children's books. All right, so so my message for you to supercharge your teaching is to explore other writing tasks. So what tasks should we use to test 101 grammar? Have a little discussion for two minutes, and when you're ready to hear my answer, uh, come back to me and I'll let you know what I think. Okay, so... Um, I sometimes hear teachers say things like, I give a comprehensive grammar test in addition to the 101 final writing exam. Or I ask students to write a research paper. That's a bit worrying to me. Because we uh, sabotage achievement with tests that do not match course objectives or what is taught. And we, we learned this from Cohen in 1987, who found that learning can often be improved by as much as two standard deviations by aligning objectives, teaching, and evaluation. In other words, uh, learning can be reduced by as much as two standard deviations by misaligning objectives, teaching, and evaluation. Now, uh, a standard deviation is this. You can see these, uh, these bars uh, across this, this standard bell curve. And uh, two standard deviations is what's represented by the, the two green bars in the center, which is like 68%. And so we're really talking a, a massive effect on, on achievement when we align these three things. So let's have a look at the grammar uh, objectives that we find at the 101 level in College ESL in Quebec. For one, uh, students are to speak for three minutes using verbs in reference to the past, and to write a meaningful text of 350 words. So this is not a discrete item grammar test, but a meaningful message with attention to the correct use of modals and a verb tenses from among the following, simple present and present continuous, simple past and past continuous, 
and the present perfect and the future. So should we use speaking and writing tasks that elicit conversational English or academic English? And this is an important question. Which register elicits the grammar listed in the objectives? Now, we can usually think of English as having four main registers. There's conversational English, an informal register, academic English, which is a formal register, news reporting, which you see on the TV news and on the radio, and fiction, which is uh, essentially storytelling. So let's just focus right now on conversational and academic English, uh, because these two uh, have uh, complementary frequency distributions. That is to say, uh, they're, they're quite different. So, for example, uh, modals. Modals, it turns out, are most common in conversation and about half as common in academic prose. So um, that's one point for conversational English and zero for academic English. Now, simple present, well, that's different. The simple present is common in both conversation and academic English. The present continuous, that's uh, more common in conversation than academic prose. How about simple past? Well, the simple past is more common in conversation than academic prose, but past continuous? No, that's more common in conversation again. The present perfect, perhaps. Well, the present perfect is about 30% um, more common in conversation than in academic prose. Um, well, the future? It turns out that the modal will is two times more common in conversation than in academic prose. And be going to is more than 14 times more common in conversation than in academic prose. And that's what we do when we give academic writing tasks to students who have just finished a review of the verb tenses in English. Okay. Academic writing tasks are fundamentally invalid in that way. We should test one-on-one students' grammar with fiction writing. Why? Because fiction writing includes conversational English as quoted speech. So you can elicit all seven of these grammar points by asking students to write fiction and by including uh, conversational English as quoted dialogue in that fiction. Okay, so number seven. Have a two-minute discussion on the following. What do you do about students who are disruptive or refuse to speak English in class. Come back to me when you're ready to hear my answer. And my answer is this. So here's a common scene played out in so many classrooms. The bored student acts out and is thrown out of class go see the principal. And this is called disciplinary removal. Now you can throw a student out for a portion of a lesson or for the day, it's called suspension, or uh, forever, and that's called expulsion. But disciplinary removal, it turns out, is an ineffective tool for teaching social behaviors needed to succeed at school. This social curriculum, as it's called, is more effectively taught uh, in the same way as other course content through uh, presentation, practice, and testing with feedback, uh, and through the consistent application of positively framed rules. For example, students must speak English in class instead of uh, students must not speak French in class. That would be a negatively framed rule. And uh, by referring students to an intervention room teacher to review the expectations of academic life. Now, if you don't have a, a, an intervention room teacher, you could uh, cooperate with another teacher in your department and ask that teacher um, to speak with students you're having difficulty with in exchange for him sending uh, students to you. And uh, we could do this simply by saying, you know, please make an appointment to meet with my colleague before next week and have that teacher review what's expected at school. We supercharge our pedagogy by creating a lesson on classroom expectations, uh, giving students opportunity to practice and, uh, and then 
test their achievement and then get a wingman, so to speak, a, a confederate, a, a colleague to help uh, explain those expectations with students who are slow to learn. Number eight, which is more effective at getting students to remember target vocabulary, would you say? Is it by circling and highlighting and underlining words in a meaningful context? Or is it uh, reading decontextualized lists of words aloud? Which would you say? Well, it turns out that reading words aloud enhances recall much more than silent study. And this applies to drawing and miming the concept. And uh, if you don't want to disturb the neighboring classrooms, even silently mouthing words can significantly enhance recall of, of target words and is named the, the production effect. This is recent research out of uh, the University of Calgary. And it tells us that circling and underlining and highlighting uh, noticing activities, which we all use, have a, a minimal effect on, on recall, on explicit memory. And it suggests to me that card games that involved a cued production, a student picks up a card and reads what's on it uh, in, a, in a cooperative or, or slightly competitive game, should have a significant effect on explicit memory. We can supercharge our students' learning by using card games to take advantage of this production effect. Now, I'll just give you an example. Here's an example of an easy game to set up. Uh, make a series of cards and uh, and have a student take a card and read the sentence containing an error and ask uh, how would you correct this error and then the error is for example it don't work now players two and three try to guess the correction and uh, say things like it doesn't work or it's don't work and player one says the correct answer and gives the card to the player with the best correction so by saying the best answer gets the benefit of the production effect and explicit memory. And then the next uh, player, the player to the left, takes uh, his turn and repeats the correct answer. It doesn't work. OK, got it. It's my turn now. In this way, all three of them have said the correct form and are more likely to remember it than if they were just simply to study it quietly. The, the object of the game is to win as many cards as possible, and the player with the most cards at the end of the game is the winner. Okay, number nine. Considering how inept teachers are, what do you think? Should students teach the lesson instead of the teacher? Turns out the answer is uh, yes. Asking students to teach a reading or a portion of the lesson has a major effect on learning. Students learn better when they take turns being the teacher, and the effect is further enhanced when students are explicitly taught to use cognitive strategies such as summarizing, questioning, clarifying, and predicting before they prepare to teach their lessons. This intervention has an effect size of 0.74, which is three and a half times the effect of reducing class size. Now, let me just say this. Uh, in listening to my talk, I hope you get something from it, but I can assure you that I've gotten a lot from it. In reading the research and summarizing it, and uh, coming up with some questions, and trying to clarify the concepts, and predicting what teachers may answer, certainly has had an effect on me, and I have thoroughly learned uh, the content of this talk. And so if you want to supercharge the department, why not include in your meetings little best practices mini lessons where teachers take turns, maybe one teacher each, each department meeting could uh, read a, a research article and present the findings to the group. It need not take more than a couple of minutes, but in so doing, not only would the department learn new things, but the person who does the presentation would uh, benefit enormously. Okay, so last one. Here's the last discussion topic for you. What can students and teachers do 
that will have the biggest impact on student performance. Talk about it for a couple of minutes, and when you're ready, you can hear my answer. And my answer is this. Asking students to predict their scores on exams and giving full-blown formative exams have the biggest effect on student performance of any intervention. So, uh, formative exams, something that teachers can do, are the most effective way for teachers to improve student performance. And it's something we do very little of because it has a significant impact on our corrections. It takes a lot of time. But it certainly has a big impact on student performance. Um, the impact is four and a half times more uh, effective than smaller class sizes. The second one is getting students to predict and report their own scores. It is the most effective way for students to improve their own performance. And here's why. Think of it. By, uh, let's say, the week before an exam, they predict their own score. In so doing, they're setting an expectation for themselves, which is uh, identical to setting a goal for themselves. And what's, what happens next is that students work very hard to achieve the, the expectation that they've set for themselves. So just by predicting scores, you can see an effect size of 1.44. That's seven times more effective than smaller class sizes. This is enormous. And it's something that teachers should uh, put into effect immediately. And, and why is it that these two things work? Well, in both cases, these interventions help students think carefully about their performance and then start strategizing and thinking of ways to improve their performance. So get your students to predict their scores the week before an exam and they, those students will make an extra effort to earn that score and live up to the, the expectations they've set for themselves. So there you go. Uh, there are my 10 mind-blowing research findings. Which of these uh, blew your mind and, and which of these will you implement next semester? Um, that's the topic I'll leave you with to discuss with your colleagues. And, uh, and if you're interested to see how I've uh, attempted to implement some of these findings in my own uh, courses, you can have a look at the, the four textbooks that I have uh, written uh, at bokumarupublications.com. And if you're interested in discussing any of this with me, the findings or, or my own uh, course books, please do not hesitate to contact me through bookandrewpublications.com or virtualwritingtutor.com and uh, I'd be happy to discuss any and uh, anything and everything uh, that, uh, that you're interested to discuss with me. So thank you very much for listening and uh, have a great semester.